Welcome to the Practical Futurist podcast, a bi-weekly show all about the near-term future with practical advice from a range of global experts to help you stay ahead of the curve. Every episode answers the question, what's the future of? With voices and opinions that need to be heard. Your host is international keynote speaker and practical futurist, Andrew Grill. Welcome to episode 11 of the Practical Futurist podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Elaine Casket, who tells stories about the impact of the digital age on how we live and how we die. She also helps others write and speak powerfully about what matters to them. She's the author of a fascinating book on the subject, All the Ghosts in the Machine, which I had the pleasure of reading ahead of our recording. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Now, we came across each other's work when you were asked to recommend a futurist for an upcoming documentary. We're both on the books as keynote speakers at International Speaker Bureau Speakers Corner. I'm glad we connected. Uh, I do love digital serendipity, and it's great to have you here in the studio today, live, as we record today. What a fascinating area you're involved in, digital afterlife. Until I'd come across your work, I hadn't really considered what happens to our digital self when we die. How did you first get involved in this area? I think it was about a year after Facebook came into being, the year that Facebook was released upon the general public, when the hounds were released. 2006, that's a pretty consequential year because a lot of things were happening around then. You know, YouTube was about a year old and Twitter was new and Facebook was new. And I was on the site doing as you do, looking around for people you went to high school with, seeing how they've changed, mm. seeing that, how that compares to how you've changed, all that good stuff. And I ran across an in memory of group, which is what happened a lot before memorialization of profiles yes, yes. became commonplace on Facebook. And this was a young woman I didn't know. It was somebody that had a similar name to somebody I was looking for. But as a psychologist, which is what I am by training, I was really fascinated to see the kinds of behaviors that were occurring on that memory group where mm. people were memorializing this young woman in particular ways. And then because privacy settings weren't then what they are now, I was able to click through to the profile that she'd kept in life and was able to see how people were behaving on that site. Yeah. And there were really interesting differences on that site. People were doing a lot of interacting, talking directly to her, continuing As if she was threads. there, yes. I miss you. And, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I so wish you could be there with us this year. Miss you, babe. All that kind of stuff with reference to photographs that she'd posted in life, continuing conversation threads from status posts that she'd done in life. So there were so many things that interested me about it. Mm. I knew that I had to go away and I was an academic at the time and worked at a university, got my ethical approval and undertook a formal study of it. So from there on out, it was a lot of talking to academics and practitioners, but as time went on and as our relationships with big technology companies have changed and as all sorts of questions have come up about who owns our data, who controls our data, who has the right to it, all of this kind of stuff, I thought this is a time when we really need to start getting these issues out in front of the wider public because it's not just about what happens to our data when we die. It's basically a bit about who owns you, who owns your digital identity, and does their ownership and control over that decrease? or actually increase when you're not there anymore? And does big tech have more of a say over what happens to your digital remains after you die, the next of kin or your family or other important people in your life? So this is what I really wanted to explore in the book. Well, I read so many business books, and for me, the introduction always tells me if I'm going to like it. What struck me about your introduction, and it really moved me, was how you found out more about your grandmother's love for your grandfather through the love letters they wrote each other while he was at war, something that didn't cross in person. How did you feel peering into their married lives? This is really interesting because I didn't at first have a way into the book. I couldn't figure it out. And then I was having a chance conversation with my mother where she was relating the discovery of this box of letters, which had been a few years prior. And as she was speaking about it and how we'd learned so much about what lay beneath, as it were, and what mm. we'd forgotten about and all the different facets of a person's life that they don't necessarily show you or they don't necessarily remember, and how that had all come to light again on reading these letters, which is an incredible parallel for what happens with all of the data that hangs around yeah. <laughs> online and then locally stored digital stuff that we have, where we uncover facets of ourselves as we go back through and people can kind of piece ideas about us together from whatever they find by searching us on the internet. So I thought there's so much resonance between this story where everybody felt a different way about engaging with these letters. I felt kind of guilty and weird and it felt very exposing and it felt very intimate to read them. And I wanted to and I did and they moved me, but I didn't have as much 
unapologetic mm. kind of stuff about it as my mother did. My mother just thought, well, privacy, what do you mean? You know, these are my parents. They passed away and it didn't cross their mind. Other people in the family wouldn't read it at all. So everybody had a different idea about what level of privacy should be on these artifacts and who ought to be able to have access to them. That's where I found the way into the book because I realized that all of those themes were present and, if anything, were thrown into sharper relief by the digital age. I was also aware that given how we communicate now in this technologically mediated way, this kind of cache of letters, which is a very coherent, yeah. chronologically arranged thing, is something that is going to become an increasingly rare phenomenon. Digital remains don't present themselves to us like that. Mm. It's a much more comprehensive in many ways, but also much more fragmented set of objects. So there's similarities and differences. I mentioned before we started recording, I keep a journal. I use the Day One app. And since 2011, I've almost journaled every day. I've got myself into the habit. And when I read through it, I mean, yesterday's entry was probably a thousand, maybe 1500 words long about what I was feeling and what I was doing. And I'm thinking, I actually don't want anyone else to read that. It's a, it's a letter to myself. And as I said, every day it comes up and says what I was doing one, two, three, four years ago, sometimes happy memory, sometimes not so much. And I think that's probably the only way you're going to have a chronological view of what was I doing day after day. And I think that's very unlike other people. But back onto the terms of digital privacy, you mentioned that. In your book, you question if you had implied permission on, to post some of these love letters online, which you did. So who owns our content when we die? This is one of the thorniest and weirdest issues that I've ever come across, and it's so it's got so many tales to it. It's difficult to do succinctly. It was difficult to do for the book in a coherent way, and I try my best to sum it up. Every time I say it, it kind of comes out a different way. I think that people assume that when their loved ones die, they're going to, and if they're next of kin, if they're a spouse or if they're a father, if they're a child, that they're going to have the same right to some digital content as they would have to a box of photographs, an album of photographs, a box of letters, that's something that's physical. Mm. So it's often really surprising to them when they find out that whatever big technology company is controlling that data, that big tech company has a different idea about who owns those things. And the rationale presented by some big tech companies like Facebook for not giving next of kin access to all of this material is often that it would be betraying the deceased entity's privacy, Yes, which is fascinating because historically the deceased have not had a right to privacy. That's a human right. And human rights belong to people with legal personalities and legal personalities belong to the living. And so that's one aspect. Big tech companies are sort of saying, well, actually, we're privileging the deceased's interests over your all's interests. But the other aspect that makes this really complicated is so much about our digital footprint is co-constructed and co-created. So all of our information is entangled with the information of other people and still living people, yes. living users who've signed up to a site with their own expectations of privacy. Now, the journal that you mentioned, the Daily Journal, which right now is for your eyes only and might always be, that's a little bit different because that's not an interaction. But so much of what we put out there on Web 2.0 is the connected web, it's connected platforms, it's dialogue, it's conversation. So if you grant somebody access to a deceased person's stuff, unless you go to some considerable effort to separate it out, you're giving them access to other people's yes. stuff as well. You might argue that that happened with letters too. Mm. But this is something that's a little bit more comprehensive and there's a lot more stuff. There's a lot more intimate, is a lot more like digital selves and digital identities than just digital footprints. I like the concept that you also bring up in the book of a digital will. You talk about the digital assets worksheet from the Digital Legacy Association, which I'd never heard of, but it's a great association. What advice could you give our listeners about which areas of their digital lives they should be paying the most attention to? Well, I mean, I suppose it depends a lot on what is important to you and people personally. And not everybody's going to know what's important to you unless you tell them and make your wishes known. So as with anything, when you're estate planning, you have to say, hey, this is what I care about. This is where the important information lies. So a lot of it depends on how you manage your digital life, which aspects of it mean something to you or are more practically important and, and which ones aren't. But I suppose the thing that has to be emphasized is no matter how much you make your wishes known, known in whatever format, 
there are always going to be limits to your control until our rights to say, this is my information and I grant it to that person are enshrined in law. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to underscore that right now in most jurisdictions, it's not. There are some places, places in the U.S. that are making it easier and clearer in law what you have your rights to. You know, for example, if you sign a designate a legacy contact on Facebook, you can trust if you live in a state that has the right law and the U.S. that they're going to hold that's going to hold water, but in the U.K. it won't. So I guess it's not. I'm not trying to be doom mongering about it because I still think it's a good idea to try to make sure that anywhere that you have important information stored, and I would really advise people if it's mediated, if it's on a platform, if it's online, if it's with a company, and that's all this information that somebody needs to settle your estate, for example, bring that on home in the best way yes, you can. Yes, yes. You know, get that on a USB stick that you can yeah, put in the safe, in the safe or yeah. print it out that you can put on a safe because there's all sorts of things that can go wrong when that information is overseen by other people. Likewise, for sentimentally important stuff, yeah. don't just trust that these platforms are going to be around forever, that you're, they're going to have your best interests at heart, that the people that you th- that care about are going to be able to get hold of it. If there are photos that are important to you, particularly important to you, print them out, yeah. get them in a more stable format that you have more control over. I have every faith that my daughter will have more access to a photo album that I create now, say of her grandparents' wedding anniversary party from last year. We fr- printed out a photo album. Her children and her children's children will definitely have more access to that probably than anything that we posted online about that at the time. Think about it. By what mechanism would a grandchild of yours be able to see, say, photos on a Facebook profile that you have? This is an as yet unborn person. In 20 or 30 years. Yeah. yeah, You know, you might designate a legacy contact, but by what mechanism does the legacy contact give some future person and then the legacy contact won't be who passes the baton? So all of these things have a massive shelf life. So my biggest advice is not so much, you know, is pull off and more within your control, whatever is important that's currently managed by online platforms. And you've got to do it frequently. You're not going to, you can't anticipate when you're going to die, Mm. but say there's an important event. Say there's something happening that you really want to kind of enshrine. It's kind of just like backing it up. It's yeah, backing indeed. it up in yeah. other formats. So we should probably explain the legacy concept. You mentioned that a couple of times on the podcast and also in the book. You even talk about how Facebook might become your funeral director. Many listeners may not know you can assign a legacy contact on Facebook for when we die, but what is a legacy contact and what can they do with your Facebook account? It used to be they couldn't do a whole heck of a lot. And in April, hopefully just before my book came out in the UK and a lot of territories, it made a major change. Some edits have been made for the next release of the book. But they didn't used to be able to do very much other than changing the profile picture, the banner picture, attaching a pinned post to the top of the page, saying something. They couldn't access any background messages. And this is something I think that sometimes people are worried about in assigning a legacy contact. Mm. They think that person will be able to see too much as never the case that they can see something on Facebook Messenger, that when a profile is memorialized, they're locked out of that stuff. With this recent raft of changes in April 2019, they gave legacy contacts much greater editorial and almost moderation powers, which is fascinating because it's another layer of responsibility. It's kind of like if you give it a physical analogy, say you have somebody buried somewhere and there's the business of keeping up the gravestone. They're a community sure, manager, basically. Yeah, making sure there's no weeds on it yeah. and making sure it's all fine or whatever. This is like if you've ever moderated an online forum, yep. you know, it's no small responsibility. So the legacy contacts now have much greater editorial powers than they once did. I think that in a way, that's the right direction of travel in terms of putting more responsibility or control back in the hands of people who probably actually knew the deceased Mm. rather than this top-down general policy stuff where everybody's the same. On the other hand, that's the aspect that I mentioned, that it's a hefty responsibility that people don't realize. It's much more complicated and long-lived than like a traditional will executor. Once the estate's settled, you're done, you know, you go home, it's over. 
who knows how long this goes on for? And that's pretty punchy. I hadn't heard about this concept until I was doing some research for our interview, but I looked at the contact of someone I knew years ago in Australia who actually unfortunately died about three years ago. I think he died alone because the Facebook page is as is. People are still wishing him happy birthday on there. That's not been memorialised, which probably means no one has access to it. It's going to sit there forever until someone taps Facebook and said this person has passed away. So I'm sure for every person that knows about this and has a legacy contact, there are hundreds if not thousands of people who just have a floating Facebook page and no one knows they can do anything with it. Absolutely. I've read some research that seems to indicate that the vast majority of profiles of the deceased are not memorialized. And for a while, Facebook was memorializing pages of people that they could verify as being deceased, even if relatives hadn't requested Mm. it. Now, this was interesting because although that's more efficient in a way and takes away that ambiguity and helps you understand what you're looking at and locks down the account to prevent unauthorized persons from getting hold of it or logging into it, it's a little bit complicated because now it's reverted to, because there was a lot of people saying, hey, my son or my daughter's Facebook profile was memorialized without my consent. There is material in there that we needed that we now can't get because it's locked down, etc. So they swung back the other way, as of the time that we're speaking anyway, things change all the time. But now, this sets up a situation where profiles can stay unmemorialized and potentially able to be compromised and logged into ad infinitum, which seems a little bit concerning. Yeah, profile cloners can clone even memorialized profiles, you know, but this is a situation where it can be more hacked in a more thorough way. So this week, as we record, Facebook are opening up some pop-up coffee shops to help people look at their privacy settings. Mm. I'm wondering why they aren't also saying, and by the way, you should be aware of this status, you can change it to. I mean, I've, I've not heard about it from Facebook directly. Should they be doing more to promote this? Well, Sheryl Sandberg, who, of course, tragically lost her own husband a few years ago, issued the press release in April. I think they entitled it something like making it easier to honor a loved one on Facebook. And they talked about the raft of changes that they were making. So you you get these press releases when they change their policies. And I think that at the time, it must not have happened to me because I already had a legacy contact. People who didn't were triggered at some point around that time, I think, to look at this in settings. I think it would be helpful if that were done periodically, you know, but also I feel like there's fairly minimal information on there. One of the pieces of information I think it's really important to have on there is this may not be legally applicable in your jurisdiction. Yeah. Because that's not at all clear. I only know that because I go, you know, hip deep into it, not because of anything that Facebook's ever told me directly. So I feel like it's kind of on the down low that what you're expressing online might not actually hold weight if something were to go wrong and a member of the family were to challenge it. So you might not have the control over your digital fate after death that, as, that you think you do. So last time I looked, Facebook is not the only platform out there. You'll nope. be surprised to know. <laughs> so what should other platforms be doing? Because I have a Twitter profile, I have Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. When I die, they're going to just stay the way they are. What, what should they be doing? Well, Facebook and Google are the platforms that have done the most obvious and you know kind of well-developed work on trying to figure out what to do with the data of the deceased. There are some other companies that may have, if you look into the fine print, for example, Yahoo, which was involved in one of the first big postmortem privacy cases. I write about it in the book, the case of Justin Ellsworth and his dad trying to get his emails off of Yahoo. He was killed in Iraq and his father wanted access to the content. But Yahoo had said it was a delete upon death policy. And and some companies might have delete upon death policies, but they don't have the mechanisms for demonstrating and proving that a person is dead or the department that handles it or mm. the you know, means to verify it. So this kind of all of that's not there. So sometimes there's an absence of policy. Sometimes there's an absence of policy that people know about. And sometimes there's an absence of personnel or AI or whatever else is needed to back that up. And so I'm of the opinion that pretty much any site, any app, anything that involves taking our personal data, they need to design with the end in mind. Even sites that aren't digital legacy websites, and those things exist, digital legacy services for the express purpose of managing your data after you're dead. Most of the platforms we use, most of the apps we use aren't that. They're just you know, services that deal with our personal data. But they need to have planning with the end in mind, and they need to stipulate 
as part of signing it up, let us know what you want to happen to this data when it isn't when you're not around anymore. That said, though, unless you have the law and the regulation at the top guiding people, it's kind of like the health and safety executive here in the UK, right? So here's the health and safety executive, and you're having a problem with a manager at work. And whatever workplace you've got, if they're subscribing to what the health and safety executive's management standards say, that HR department will say, oh, here's the six management standards, whatever procedure we have, they make reference to those management standards. There's guidance from up Mm. here. We're in a situation where we don't have guidance from up here. So I think that all companies that operate online and with our personal data need to have ideas about what happens with, with the end and when the end comes. But ultimately, we've got to get this up to the level of law and regulations, and, law, and the people at that level aren't dealing with it. I couldn't agree more. The reason I decided to dedicate a whole podcast on this is because I think it's so important. Because I'm a futurist, I need to look at the future. In the future, I won't be here and my family will be. So I think it's so important. And I, if our show and others can actually help raise that, as you say, when you sign in, let's sign in, hear all your details. By the way, maybe not right there, dedicated legacy contact, but in about a week's time, we're going to remind you that we want to know what you want to do if something happened to you because it's it's going to happen. I think it should happen at point of sign up. Mm. I, I don't think that it's an account more, should maybe be Maybe it's too morbid. But it, join this great site. By the way, when you die, what are we going to do? But the thing is, is that people go through and they tick all yeah. the things. They'll tick all sorts of other stuff, Indeed. won't they, with respect yeah. to the data. And and this is the thing. There's no sense in not looking at it. You know, that you know, at least when there is then law, right, you know, there's already the infrastructure in mind, you yes. know, you know, created so that companies don't have to scramble to and it, it causes less problems. It's an for extra them. field, one extra field. Who's well, your legacy contact? One extra yeah. field and the training and mm. of course that you know whatever their policy is they have to have the infrastructure to back that up so that it's not just putting something on a page or sort of saying if you want us to do this with it then they have to be prepared to do that they think okay well if we get notified well who's going to get notified how are we going to get notified what are we going to ask for who can provide proof of this person's passing you know all of the traditional structures like you know tax structures and bank structures and government structures they're pretty well set up for bereaved people they're well established, there are systems in place for brief people to be able to say, this person's dead, here's the here's the documentation. But in terms of our whole online life, it's a completely different story. Some of the stories I've heard about people trying to get stuff managed is the last thing you want. It's the last thing you want, you know, at a time like that, to be grappling with all those kinds of things when you just need to get things taken care of. So you're the mother of a nine-year-old. What advice are you giving her about her digital life and is she taking it to heart? The advice is flowing the other direction, actually, because one of the strands in the book that I didn't really expect to come out so powerfully is this is really a book largely about privacy. And privacy in our online existence is, of course, a lot more than just about what happens to our data after we tie throughout the whole thing. And so the second to last chapter of my book, I talk a little bit about how much influence I'd had on my daughter's ultimate digital legacy. And not just that, but kind of on the formation and development of her personality Mm. through putting stuff about her online. Because nobody ever met that child new. Nobody ever met that child with fresh eyes. They all It was all filtered through what I disclosed about her yes. on social media. I'm an expat. I'm from America. People in America, of course, hadn't met her. But when they did, they would ask her these questions that were just soaked with expectations about what she was going to say because they felt like they knew her already from Facebook Mm. because of the way she was presented. And that was such a powerful thing for me to have done that I never thought about. And she, in a recent conversation about sharenting, you know, parents sharing stuff online, she really took me to task for this. And she talked very, very cogently and articulately about what she felt people should and shouldn't be doing online with respect to sharing other people's data. Because never forget, our digital footprint isn't just formed by us. It's by what other people share about us. It's about what other people put out there about us. And so this was the aspect that I felt like one of the pieces of advice that I would give other kids and other families that I wish I'd have this conversation with my daughter sooner is that you need to talk to your family members and to your close associates about what you want and how you feel about various things being shared because we don't think about that aspect of our digital footprint. And that's the sort of unexpected twist that I didn't expect that to be part of the book, actually. But it turned out to be so relevant. I started creating my daughter's eventual digital legacy before she was born. 
So I want to explore that a bit because when we compare our digital self to our true self, you talk about a context collapse, and I hadn't heard that term before. I'm probably guilty of that in some respect. What is context collapse and how does this fit in with a personal brand? Context collapse, there's a sociologist by the name of uh, William Vesh from the States who talked about this in, on YouTube, quite a study quite a few years ago now, a paper, a theoretical paper. And he said out there in the physical world offline, you could have you know how you are at the gym and how you are at work and how you are with your family and how you are with your family of origin. And you can kind of compartmentalize things. You can kind of keep these boundaries and present quite differently in all sorts of different settings. I think that's just normal. You sort of regulate how you are and how you're interacting depending on the, the context, right? But online, there's context collapse. So if you use one email account emailing all these different people, you show all these different facets of yourself. Or if somebody does a Google search of you, they will find all sorts of different aspects some of which you wish they didn't know, some of which you didn't even realize were out there. I do an exercise in my talks called Eulogy for a Digital Stranger. And there's a volunteer or more, more than one volunteer from the audience who gives us a starting point. It can be Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, anything part of their digital footprint. And then the audience has only 15 minutes to group up and to compose a one or two minute eulogy and I tell them, you do this like you knew this person. You tell, you make this as personal as possible. This is your summing up of what they were really about, what they cared about, who, you know, all that stuff. It is a shocking exercise because in a quarter of an hour, because of course the volunteer can feed back about mm. how it is, because of the context collapse, both in time and in you know source of feedback and all the different platforms, people can give the most stunning summation of this person, this volunteer. Sometimes there are factual inaccuracies, but in terms of the kind of, it's amazing what people can pull together. So this is an illustration, but it's funny, people knit together the story in a way that you wouldn't have. You know, they, they emphasize things that you might not have. They prioritize things where you're like, well, that's not the main thing or whatever. So depending on how they search it and what they find, they'll knit together a different narrative of who you are and what you're about. And so that's how a different story can be created about us after we're gone than the story we would have created for, you know, sort of told for ourselves. How do the subjects react to that? Because they're being eulogized and they're in the room. They're stunned. I did this at Rebel Book Club, which is an amazing nonfiction book club here in London. It's got chapters in Berlin and elsewhere as well. There were three volunteers and they were sat up with me. And one person had a song from their Spotify profile playing in the background and a YouTube video of them playing on the screen. And they were talking about them and members of their family. And the person was absolutely gobsmacked. And a lot of the reactions are, I had no idea that was out there about me. And sometimes that's because they didn't put it there. It was their mother or their partner or their sister or their friend or whatever. And it was drawn from all of those places. And so every single way and every single direction, the different contexts in which we live our lives in the physical world collapse into this bricolage online. It's fascinating. So I've had guests on the show talk about fintech and suretech you're in the death tech space. I'm in the death tech space. That's so funny because my colleague, James Norris, from the Digital Legacy Association, years ago, he went to South by Southwest when he initially launched Dead Social, right? And some guy came up to him. I don't remember what year it was. I think, I can't remember. I feel like it was, I'm going to say the wrong year, so never mind. But some guy comes up, he's like, hey, man, yeah, you're in the death tech space. I'm in the death tech space too. Cool. Awesome. And James was like being very English. He was sitting there thinking, what? The death tech space? <laughs> You know, and, and so there are a lot of people in the death tech space, more than you'd imagine, but they're all kind of fragmented out. There's lawyers and academic lawyers who are interested in the legal side of mm. things. There are, you know, developers who sometimes have like an intellectual technological fascination or have this marketing fantasy like, oh, my God, I have a product for everybody because 100 percent of people die and I'm going to be a millionaire. And they don't realize that so many developers have gone before them and like failed with their digital legacy stuff. So there's developers, there's lawyers, there's like regulators trying to get their head around it and then yeah. like backing away yeah. and like thinking about something else. Uh, there's philosophers, there's digital ethicists. So there's so many people who are interested in this particular area. And it's only going to get more intense because the thing is, more of a critical mass of people are starting to die, right? So 
we forget how short of a time this has been around. And we're going to get to the point where all of these digital era folks are going to start dying off. And we want to make sure that we know where we're at with this stuff so that we'll avoid being wrong-footed in the future. So, Elaine, are you ready? If you were to die tomorrow, what are you doing personally to prepare for your own digital afterlife? I'm 60% ready, Andrew. 60%, okay. Yeah, um, Does that mean you live to 100? <laughs> I have done a lot more than most people have done sure. with respect to, well, doing my actual will and my, you know, lasting powers of attorney and things like that. So I'm really sorted out in that space. I have a practice where I pull sort of important digital stuff off regularly and physicalize it, you know, in photo books. I am making sure that I continue oral storytelling stuff in terms of, you know, talking to my kid about stories I've heard and sharing stories with, you know, upper generations, because that's a tradition that will never change. Mm. Whatever the digital yes, world yes. has changed, it hasn't changed yeah. that. So a lot of those things, which don't sound explicitly digital, are things to counteract. Uh, you know, I make sure that I'm kind of engaging and recording stuff and keeping stuff in, in a non-digital format that other people know the significance of. I do have a legacy contact on Facebook, but most of what I'm trying to do isn't specifically about me. It's about other things. It's about a call to action to organizations Mm. and to lawmakers and to regulators, whoever's got their head in the sand, that they need to get their head out of the sand and start designing for the end from the beginning. Now, at the end of the book, you provide 10 excellent tips for us to get our digital life in order before we die. If I hold you to just three things, as this is the Practical Futurist podcast, what can listeners be doing next week to prepare for their digital afterlife? The last thing was forget immortality. And I I think give up any conceit or assumption of online is forever, because we have this very much in our discourse as online is forever. It's often offered as a cautionary tale. Somehow it's become truth in our minds and it's not. Online's so not forever. There's all sorts of ways in which stuff can go by the wayside. So if there's important stuff to you, make sure that it's stored in something that's more stable. We can... Still, you know, the historians of the future might be able to get their hands on Egyptian papyrus scrolls more easily than they'll be able to find a MySpace profile from 2004, right? So there's that. The other thing is always assess and never assume because we tend to think that the things that the same laws or rules that apply to physical stuff applies to digital stuff and it doesn't. Very often we don't have the right to pass on digital stuff the way that we think that we do. So always check the terms and conditions and ask the questions that you need to ask. And the third one, I'm going to go cheekily off book, although not not really. I think it's in there somewhere in some format, is to spread the word about this yes. uh, because I'm trying to do that. And I'm hoping that by extension, people who engage with this idea and read the book do it as well. This is something that every single journalist who talks to me says, I've never thought about this before. Yeah, me too. And I want that to stop happening quite as much <laughs> because I want this to be something that's much more on people's radar. So how can people find out more about you and your work? Right. Well, you can go to elainecasket.com, where there's all sorts of links to places I'm going to be speaking or stuff I've been writing or stuff that's been uh, happening about the book in the press. They can look out for the, it's now now in the UK and in most territories around the world in trade paperback, and it's going to come in a more compact B format paper book soon in the new year in 2020. And just keep on engaging with this idea and give me a, a follow me on Twitter if you want, also on Elaine Casket. And I'm always happy to talk to people and speak to people and different audiences about this topic. So shoot me an email and we can talk. Elaine, thank you so much for your time today. Of course. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Practical Futurist podcast. You can find all of our previous shows at futurist.london. And if you like what you've heard on the show, please consider subscribing via your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. You can find out more about Andrew and how he helps corporates navigate a disruptive digital world with keynote speeches and C-suite workshops at futurist.london. Until next time, this has been the Practical Futurist Podcast.